uh, I was editor of the high school newspaper and I was kind of infatuated with the sort of power and responsibility of the press and bold public opinion. I remember one particular uh, editorial I wrote on, on Lyndon Baines Johnson on the road to vice presidential obscurity. That was about one year before uh, JFK was assassinated. And, then, and Johnson, of course, became president of that. Uh, but then it, I figured if I went to Caltech, I'd go to physics because you couldn't do journalism in a place like Caltech. Then I realized if I went to Stanford that I would have my academic record compared to my older brothers for four more years. And the mere thought of that was enough for me to decide to go to Caltech. So that's why I went into physics. Now let me tell you that in retrospect, looking back at that, I was clearly making the right decision, but for the wrong reason. Don't decide to do something because of some lofty ideal that, 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 that you think is worth uh, dedicating your, your existence to. Because if you don't really enjoy the day-to-day -day activities associated with any sort of uh, a career, you will become miserable in that career. And you probably not do a very good job of it. Lucky if you get the stage. So, so for me, I, I made the right decision, but for the wrong reason. Uh, if you look, if I look back at that time, as I do now, at my childhood, I started at age six, tearing my my toys apart to get the electric motors out because I liked to play with them. When I was eight, my father gave me the camera that he had used when he was a child, and within two hours, it was in little tiny pieces all over the living room carpet. My parents never scolded me when I did crazy things like this. Uh, they sort of regarded it as, as, as a healthy curiosity and in fact tried to satisfy that curiosity. But the more you try to satisfy a curiosity, the bigger it gets. It's really it's one of these amazing things. And so my parents, my father would bring home watches and tell me, well, why don't you try to take this watch apart and put it back together again? And, I, and he gave me the little screwdrivers. And I got very good at taking watches apart and putting them back together. There were always parts left over. The watches would work. And I don't understand why they put all those extra parts in watches. Those are these old kind of watches, you know, that had wire balance wheels and stuff like that. You guys probably don't have any. And I think I discovered gunpowder at, at, at age 10. Uh, you could go down to the local sporting goods store and buy it by the pound. So rockets and bombs and uh, you name it. Uh, uh, I made a muzzle-loading rifle that went off accidentally in the house and put a hole through two walls. And the rule of thumb was that, that if something really, I would say, life-threatening occurred, that that phase of my experimentation was over. So I just said, well, you know, I understand that we will not come anymore with muzzle-loading rifles. You know, rockets were still okay. And then I discovered high-voltage electricity. And I, back in those days, you could go down to the the uh, neon sign transformer place, and for a quarter, you could buy a used 15,000 volt transformer. And uh, a great Jacob's ladder for 15,000 volts. That was a lot of fun. And then I sort of learned about DC versus AC electricity, and then I started storing charge in capacitors. And once I discharged 600 volts across my body, and it was, I don't know how close it, how dangerous it was, but I, I actually woke up on, across the room. It's literally true that it just threw me across the room. My parents didn't even know about that one, so I was allowed to continue doing that sort of thing. I was, I was always into stuff, and I think the reason I went into physics really was that my parents tolerated an enormous amount of curiosity on my part. Curiosity which was, I suppose, in some sense, dangerous. Uh, and in fact, it, what's true is that amongst my generation, a good fraction of experimental physicists have at least one finger missing. And in fact, uh, the three people that got the Nobel Prize this year, uh, Bob Laughlin, uh, Horst Stormer, and Dan Sui. Horst Stormer has one finger missing. He's from Germany, but even he played with bombs when he was a kid. So I'm not saying you should all go out and play with bombs. But, but I think what I'm trying to say is that you should look at what it is that you really enjoy doing uh, through up to this point in your life when you want to decide what it is to go into. Now, what's true is... These more look at You guys may wonder what this is all about. I, I hope I'll feel to tell you a little bit. Uh, I mean, you haven't been exposed to everything. If you go to a place like Stanford, you surely will learn a lot. And I think people, I have an example is Sandy. She says she decided against physics because of my class, but I'm sure that she found lots of other things that were 
this would be more exciting, right, Sam? Yeah, okay, right. It's like becoming a super, super winner for That's what the J stands for. I don't know. That's the that's dorm? Yeah. So, so anyway, so um, <laughs> I missed something. What did I miss? Nothing. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's that's really. I went to Caltech, and and uh, I was not a. I mean, I wasn't a great student at Caltech. In fact, well, I graduated with honors, but but I had to work off the hard. Well, I mean, it, I wasn't near the top of my class. And in my sophomore year, when I tried to declare physics as a major, there was a representative of the physics major, and he said, "Well." This was back in the days when Richard Feynman, for all anyone that knows, I'm sure you're joking, Mr. Feynman, or all yeah. that sort of stuff. I mean, he was a, sort of regarded as a cult figure at Caltech. He was a professor there, just teaching undergraduates, and everyone wanted to, to become a physicist. So I would say probably two thirds of my class showed up at this uh, uh, informational meeting with a representative of the physics department, and he said. Surely you can't all go into physics, it's much too hard if you're not near the top of your class, forget it. And he said, besides that, even if you are, be prepared to work very hard for the rest of your miserable existence. Well, that was for your life, I think, is what he said. He said, there's always someone out there that's, that's smarter than you are, and you guys are competing for the same resources to do research with. And, and so he, then he said that he had his best ideas at 3 in the morning. <laughs> So, you know, I, I thought back at that, that uh, discussion after I left there, and I said, well, maybe I should become an electrical engineer. So I declared electrical engineering as a major, and, uh, and the first electrical engineering course I took was a course on the transistor, and I was very excited because I always wanted to know how transistors work. I built my first transistor radio when I was 11 years old, I think, and, and you know, I was, I was really into electronic stuff. Uh, and, but in fact, this course didn't deal with how transistors worked at all. It only dealt with with uh, how to use transistors in circuits. So it told you it treated the transistor as a three-terminal black box with parameters that, that, that related the inputs to the outputs. And so, after taking this course, was bed at eight in the morning, which is very early for undergraduates for Stanford. Well, I forget it. There are people that, that have to do eight o'clock classes, right, Sandy? But you'd never make it. So Sandy wouldn't do that. No. Though it was eight, eight in the morning, so it was pretty bad. Anyway, I decided that I prefer becoming a, a mediocre physicist than a frustrated engineer, so I changed my major. Now, let me, that is not, probably wasn't a very good perspective on, on engineering looking at that one course, but I think at the undergraduate level, really what engineers do is learn how to design and build circuits, typically. Uh, I wanted to know how things worked. That's what I'd been doing all the time when I was when I was uh, in high school, and uh, and so I thought I could get that better going in physics. And I declared physics as a major. And I suppose I've never been particularly uh, unhappy that I've done so. I went to Cornell for graduate school, and I, I will tell you that I there was I wanted decided I wanted to do what's called condensed matter physics or solid state physics. I, as, as an undergraduate at Caltech, I worked in astrophysics. But in astrophysics, you don't actually do experiments. You simply make observations. And, and for you guys, it's probably not a very large difference. But I wanted to control the things that I studied. I wanted to be able to poke them and prod them and get them to give, me, give up their most dark secrets. That, that was what I wanted to do. And, and uh, you can't poke or prod a, a neutron star or a, uh, a galaxy or something like that. You just make these observations and you put a lot of them out there so you can improve the water. Anyway, so I, I decided I'd go into solid state physics, and uh, but there was no one at, at Caltech who could give me very good information about where to go. There was really no one at Caltech at the time in condensed matter of solid state physics. So I just applied to a bunch of schools. In fact, I went to my faculty advisor and I asked him what the good schools were. And he told me all the schools that had good tandem van de Graaff accelerators because he was a nuclear experimentalist and he just thought that any sane individual who was going into physics at that time would go to nuclear. So in the spring, there was a guy named, named uh, Mossbauer. I don't know if Mossbauer, I think he already had his Nobel Prize for the Mossbauer fact, but he called it gamma resonance spectroscopy. Never referred to it as Mossbauer. Came to Caltech 
And I asked him where I should go, and he looked at the list of places that I applied, and he said, well, there are only two good places in the United States, and you didn't apply to either one. And I said, where were the good places? And he said, well, uh, UC Berkeley, across the bay. Which way is across the bay that way? Which direction is across the bay? I have no idea. That way, okay. I have no, you guys didn't give me a compass. Anyway, uh, and the other one was the University of Illinois. I said, well, the places I didn't apply, and he suggested that maybe Cornell would be okay. Well, it turns out that, that most people's perceptions of a university, particularly graduate department, I think, are very much out of date. And his, I think his perception was probably 10 years out of date. And, and, and Cornell was an extremely good place to go, and I was very lucky. As soon as I got there, I could see how exciting this place was. So I got sucked into low temperature physics. Uh, started doing research. Uh, I built a device called helium-3 helium-4 dilution refrigerator my first year of graduate study. This is something which would allow you to cool down, allow me anyway, to cool down to about 15 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. And there were other new technologies that did look like they ought to be able to get you down to within a couple thousandths of a degree of absolute zero, maybe even colder. I was absolutely convinced that, that there would be uh, opportunities for new discoveries just because of your ability to use this new technology to look at nature in a realm in which you've never been seen before. And I, this was during the Vietnam War era, and I kept writing my draft board to get my draft exemption uh, extended for another year, and I told them how exciting this research was, and I don't know whether they believed it, that I was the only student from Aberdeen, Washington, that had ever gone to college with gone into physics or for what, I don't, they, they kept doing that. But I was, uh, in a sense, I suppose I was a man possessed. I really felt that, that this was a new technology that was going to lead to something very exciting. But I didn't really know what it was. And it was my last year of graduate study, my fifth year, uh, which is sort of typical for experimental, five to six years, beyond four years of undergraduate. So it takes a long time. You're taking a, making a big commitment to go into physics. That, that uh, I was uh, thinking really about what experiment I would do. I was already married. My wife, by the way, is also Chinese, but she, she was born in China and grew up in Taiwan. Uh, Sandy was born in Taiwan, is that right? And grew up everywhere. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and uh, my wife was had got her degree after our third week. We, we went to, to Cornell about the same time together. We met, in fact, before either one of us had found housing in the graduate student cafeteria. And we dated a, a while, and then I would call her up to invite her to a football game, and, and uh, uh, she would say, too busy. And so after she'd done that about four times, of course, I said, too busy is a euphemism for get out of my life. So we stopped dating, but we met again, uh, I guess, in, in the middle of our second year of graduate study. We, started we got married in, you know, at the end of the third year. Uh, thank you. <laughs> what was that? Bell. School's out. Oh, that's a bell that says you guys are late. I'm oh, sorry. No. Anyway, so, so you know, I, real, I didn't actually want to get, get married until I had gotten my PhD, because I wasn't sure really deep in in my soul that I would ever be able to do research. I mean, I was very good at designing and building things. Technically, I was first, but I had never done a research experiment that had told man something new about nature that, that, that no one in the world had ever known before, and that's what research is really all about. So it was kind of scary. Going into my last year of graduate study, the job market in physics was very bad. There was a guy that worked with me during my fourth year that sent his resume to 100 different places and managed to get one job offer. And this guy was actually very good. And so I told my thesis advisor that I wanted to do a really good piece of work, and so he should give me a really challenging topic. Back in those days, they would give me topics. And he said, well, why don't you measure some property of, of there was a, it turns out that liquid helium-3, when you compress it, it solidifies. And, and the solid uh, undergoes a magnetic phase transition, which, which was believed to be at about two thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. So he said, why don't you study some property through this ordering transition, which no one had ever seen before. So it was only conjectured that it would be two milligrams based on high temperature properties that people had measured. And so I thought that that's what I would do. And I got in there, and I was, no one was looking for superfluid helium-3, which is what I discovered. 
So there was then an experiment that was done by a guy named uh, uh, John Wheaton, who was a professor at UC San Diego, and he sent us his results, and they just seemed very strange. The trouble is, you know, things that, are, that, that seem to uh, contradict your intuition still be right in low physics. A lot of things are very weird in low physics. For instance, the system that I study, mixtures of liquid and solid really free, have their very unusual and unique property, I should say, the, the, the latent heat of, of fusion, that is, the, the, normally you think to form ice, for instance, you have to withdraw heat from the, from the liquid, right? Well, for solid helium-3, it's exactly the other way around. If you're below 3 tenths of a degree, if you're at 20 milligrees, for instance, in order to form solid helium-3, you have to add heat to the liquid. It has a negative latent heat. It's the only substance in the world that does. So saying weird things doesn't mean it's wrong. I mean, you have to go in and check it. And I decided I'd go in and check these results out, and this would make a pretty nice thesis. And I went in there, and what we found very quickly, though, was that this result, which was very exciting, was, was very wrong. And this is, unfortunately, this is frequently true, that the most exciting results are not there. So these guys, their thermometer had been bad, and, and the properties that they measured that looked very exciting uh, were simply a result of the fact that they had, their, they, their temperatures were not right. And when I, when I did the experiment correctly, I saw nothing that looked like uh, what, what they had suggested. In fact, it was, it was exactly what the very simple theory suggested should exist. So I was rather disappointed, and I kept doing this experiment because the effect was very small, as opposed to the one which we at least proved it seemed was very large, and it was hard to measure. And then eventually another couple of graduate students told me that I had been on this experiment for so long that, that they, in fact, uh, had been held up. They wanted to use the, the same apparatus. Back in those days, uh, we measured temperature by, by, in fact, we still do, doing a nuclear magnetic resonance experiment. This is sort of one component of what MRI is all about. And you have to do this in a large magnetic field. So this is a picture of me uh, sitting. OK, that's me. And as you can see, I have not changed very much over the years. Uh, and this thing that I'm leading against is, is an iron core electromagnet. This is the kind the chemists used to use before they had superconducting magnets to do NMR experiments. And uh, uh, so we, this lab only had one of these things. It weighs a few tons. And it would roll between this crash that this vertical thing, is basically a thermos jug with liquid nitrogen and liquid helium in it. And there's another one down here. And it roll this next one over. And they could do their experiment. Well, I was I was still hoping I could get better results, so I decided I I, I would give them the, the magnet, but then hope that their experiment didn't work. The low temperature apparatus is very delicate, and frequently you pull these things down, and a leak falls off, or, or a leak opens up, or something like that, and you can't do the experiment. And so I was hoping that in fact their experiment would fail, in which case I would get the magnet back. But as long as I had to stay cold, I decided that I would try to do some sort of an experiment. And, and, and that, that was during that time when I was doing an experiment that really wasn't scheduled, uh, that, that we actually measured the effect that, that we saw. This is really what it looked like. I won't try to explain to you what this is all about. So this is, we're applying, I guess I will. Okay, this is pressure, melting pressure, uh, in this mixture of liquid and solid helium-3. And it's about 34 atmospheres versus time. And so, the fact that this is rising says that the cell is cooling as we convert liquid to solid. So if you convert liquid to solid without adding heat to the system, in fact, the system has to cool. That's what a negative weight heat is all about. Here I rebalance the, the thermometer uh, the pressure gauge, and so it keeps cooling. And then at this point, in fact, you can see that the rate of cooling has decreased by about a factor of three. And I saw that, and I was very unhappy to see that, because it suggested that this apparatus that I built wasn't working very well. We tried it, that was the day before Thanksgiving, 1971. So I tried this again the day after, well, that next Monday, and here it is, the same. And we saw something look very similar, and then I looked at, at, look, looked at, at the true pressures of these, of these kinks, and the pressure reproduced to a part of 50,000. So I said, this, this cannot be a chance coincidence. It must be that this, this feature results from some highly reproducible phase transition inside this mixture of liquid and solid helium-3. 
And I suppose that, that after having made that, that discovery, that the rest of it was simply a matter of persistence. But in fact, I can tell you when I made this discovery, when I realized what this is all about, in fact, even as I think about it, the adrenaline starts flowing through my veins again. It's very exciting that you discover such a thing. Unfortunately, they don't happen very often. So the trouble was that we guessed that these transitions were in solid helium three. And here, here, in fact, is, is the paper that we submitted, evidence for new phase of solid helium three, and Richard Basharoff Richardson, and they, these are the two people I shared in the Nobel Prize with. And this is a picture of the apparatus that I actually designed, by the way, while I was in the hospital recovering from knee surgery. So you see that if you use your time well, even something as bad as a skiing accident can, in fact, have really important consequences, positive consequences. Anyway, so I suppose if we didn't continue at this point, we wouldn't have gotten a Nobel Prize. But, but in fact, I was one of these people who I had this curiosity was insatiable. And so I just said, all right, how can we look at this system in a, in a much more straightforward fashion than by just throwing on an emic business that we could doing? And so I basically developed a form of, an early form of magnetic resonance imaging, which allowed us to look at the distribution of liquid and solid helium 3 inside the cell as a function of, of vertical position. And it was when we did that that we understood what was going on. So, so I can tell you that, well, let me see if I have anything else. So I have a few more great view graphs to show you guys. Ah, that one. Oh, that's way at the end. Here we go. Uh, okay, this is what physics was like back, back in, in uh, the 19, 1960s. Okay, now this is, this is me uh, with my eyes closed here. And uh, uh, this is a guy named Lowell Thompson, University of Sussex in England. This is Bob Richardson with whom I shared the prize. And this guy here is Bill Halpern. He gave me this view graph. Uh, Bill Halpern is now uh, uh, the chairman of the physics department at, at Northwestern University. And we were on our way to, to a, a, a low temperature conference in the uh, Banff National Park in Canada. And this was in the Toronto airport. We were pitching nickels against the wall to see who was going to pay for coffee that morning. So that's what we were doing at that time. <laughs> anyway, so eventually we made this discovery. And I can tell you that, that it was very making the real discovery, really understanding what it was all about. Let me show you when that happened. You recall I told you that, that this representative from the physics department at Caltech said he had his best ideas at 3 in the morning? Well, this is from my lab notebook, April 20th, 1972, 2.40 in the morning. Have discovered the BCS transition in liquid helium-3 tonight. And then I explain what this is all about. BCS is, is a theory of, of BCS stands for Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer. They were the three people that explained superconductivity. Shortly after uh, their theory was published, people began to speculate that, that other s fluid systems at low temperatures might undergo similar phase transitions uh, because of the same physics, but it looked a little bit different. And in fact, helium-3 was the first one where people had proposed that that might happen. Uh, and people had spent about, oh, five, five, six or seven years, all over the world, people looked at this transition, no one found it. So everyone eventually gave up and decided that this was simply a pipe dream on the part of the theorists that it wouldn't really exist. That is, in fact, what I found. And, and this, I can tell you that, that this was within 10 minutes of the time that I got the call from the people in Stockholm. It was 2.30 in the morning on October 9th, 1996. So the time was very close, but if you ask me which one of those two times was more exciting for me personally, this is it right here. This was extremely exciting. I didn't get any sleep that night at all. Of course, I, I, that, I should say that I would usually work until about 4 in the morning and then go home and, and, and sleep from 4 until 2, 11. That was usually when my wife and I would work when we would go in. That way we didn't have to worry about breakfast. But uh, I, got, I realized what, what it was that we discovered and then I wanted to share this with people. So I went all around the basement of the physics building at, at Cornell. There wasn't a single soul there. I went up to the top floor. That's where the theorists sit. Theorists think they have to be closer to God for divine inspiration. There was, you know, sometimes they would fall asleep at their desk, but in fact, there was no one up there. So eventually, at four in the morning, I called my thesis advisor. 
And of course, I knew he would be asleep. And I always tell my graduate students they should feel welcome to call me at four in the morning, but it better be good. Anyway, so Dave Lee was very excited about this, and we published our uh, correct explanation of what it was that we saw, and then we basically, I don't think any of us thought we were going to get the Nobel Prize for this work. I mean, it was exciting and it was interesting, but Nobel Prizes are things that are given to great people for great pieces of physics, who were we after all. And I, I would say it was probably about six years after that that people began to tell me that they nominated me for the Nobel Prize, and I thought this it was preposterous at first, but you know, hearing this year after year, and after a while, when it comes October and they're starting to announce the prize, and you get kind of nervous, is it going to be given this year? And then after a while, it took me 25 years. It took us 25 years. So I, I can say the average is 17 in physics. So eventually I said, well, if it happens, that's fine. But if it doesn't happen, you know, that's fine too. There are a lot of disadvantages to being a Nobel laureate after all. And in fact, when I got the prize, I'll tell you how the phone call went. This guy says, hello, hello, is this Nobelist Astronaut? With a Swedish accent. And I said, yes. And you realize it's 2.30 in the morning. Because, you know, look, here I was, you know. Uh, first of all, the, the phone in, in the bedroom was my wife's side of the bed. But she never answered it. So I got up and ran around my pajamas. And I was standing there in the dark. I was sure it was the wrong number, even though he'd asked for me by name. And then he says, uh, this is Carl Jakobsen of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. It is my pleasure to inform you that you and your colleagues, David Lee and Robert Trippin, then eventually paused. As soon as he said the, the Royal Swedish Academy, of course, I knew what this was all about. And I just sat there. And then he pauses, and I said, oh my goodness. And then he goes on for a little bit longer, and then he pauses again, and I said, oh my goodness. And he says, and you were stunned. But I'll tell you what happened at that moment. I was sitting there thinking, that here I was, you know, in this rather vulnerable position, my pajamas, in the middle of the night in the dark, and my life was changing right before my eyes. And I kind of liked the old life, and I wasn't sure what the new one would be like. And it was kind of scary thinking about that. I didn't have a long think of it because, in fact, I started getting phone calls by about three in the morning, and I would hang up the phone, and within ten seconds, it rang again. There'd be someone else in Colombia or Germany or Spain or you name it. There were all places all over the country were calling up for, for interviews and telephone interviews. And by four in the morning, there was a photographer in my house taking pictures of me in my pajamas, <laughs> hair plastered down on the side. That was the one that showed up in my hometown newspaper. So uh, it was a pretty exciting time. Let me say that, that, that we went off to Stockholm then, and, and I should show you, oh, I have, actually, we have the video tape, don't we? Is that right? Is it ready to go? Yeah. I don't know if everyone can see this. This is just a little piece of the video tape of the presentations of the Nobel Prize. So they're talking about what the prize work was. It's all in the has shown that any of the has at least three different superfluid phases, which one occurs only if the sample is placed in a magnetic field. As a quantum liquid helium-3, thus exhibits a considerable more complex structure than helium-4. Just a little bit. For example, and it's the topic, which means that it has different properties in different spatial directions which doesn't occur in classical liquids, but more resembles the properties of liquid crystals. So the people on the back of the stage are members of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and those who are the product of the microscopic vortices of the phenomenon, which is also known as superfluid helium-4, has in helium-3 led to extensive research since its vortices can assume more complex forms. Professor Richardson. This Richardson here. You have been awarded the 1996 Nobel Prize in Physics. The only part in English is this. For your discovery of superfluidity helium-3. Your discovery has greatly enlarged our knowledge of the possible state of the condensed matter. On the half, the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, I wish to congratulate you on this achievement and I ask you to step forward and receive your prize from the hand of His Majesty the King. We are now about to receive a prize from the
the Swedish king, Professor Lee, first of all. The king is a very interesting person, by the way. Really neat guy. He's like 1965. He is, is 65 years old, I'm sorry. And the eldest of the three laureates in physics. We had a reversal where we learned how to bow. David uh, Lee's uh, parents are apparently 92 and 94 years old. Mrs. Darius D. Osheroff, the young one among the three. And as you all know, you know where he works, Stanford University, that's right. This is my older brother, who was a Stanford undergraduate. Well, this is my wife, and she's wearing sort of a Chinese Finally, robe sort of thing. We can either buy expensive evening, evening gowns or, or have at have the evening evening university of the sun. to hear that fanfare several times during the rest of the program. That's the fanfare that accompanies every uh, every presentation. It is every professor's dream that his graduate student will do as Nobel Prize winning experiment and he'll share the prize. This is by the way the gold room. I don't know if anyone there's a that's like I'm so down to all if you take the American photo magazine, there's a picture of this, and we'll story about it. We should have gotten this live broadcast, and the interviewer has not had her interview. Let's just listen to the first few of these questions. They're kind of interesting. Professor Osher, is it true that you tried to blow up your brother when he was small? I had no idea. No, it was an accident. Yes, really? Please, that's it. Well, I know, of course, it's bitter about that, <laughs> but I, I, I think that his, his life was in no more jeopardy than mine was. I had a wild childhood. You did? Yes. You broke down toys and you gave your schoolmates electrical chuck shocks, is that true too? That's, well, I was just small shocks, not big. Because you were saying, I'm an expert in the world, and I'm an expert in the world, and I'm an expert in the world. Och han konstruerar en maskin som var såna klasska bra elektrikförsörjning. Uh, apart from the joking side, was that a good start for research in physics? Fantastic. It was great. I wish that more of my graduate students had that kind of background. You mean that seriously? Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, you don't have to blow up your brother or anything like that, but, but uh, to, to put things together with your hands uh, over and over again, electrical things, mechanical things, uh, chemical things, you develop a certain amount of physical intuition that is very useful in the laboratory. I think that's the type of background for that he a good forsker in physics. When the superfluidity of helium-3 was discovered, you, as a, uh, uh, the youngest one, really was the one that noticed it. How come? Well, I mean, I was the graduate student doing the work, and it did that. Graduates always do the work. <laughs> Secretary of State, 
And I spent probably the better part of a half hour explaining to her what I thought were the moral and ethical issues regarding Bosnia and how happy I was that, that, that Bill Clinton had gotten the, the United States involved in, in stopping the, the terrible things that were going on uh, in that country. And I still feel very, very strongly about that. I think that that, that was a far more moral and ethical thing to do than anything that, that, that anyone might think that he's done since then. That's my personal opinion. We won't discuss politics. But, but anyway, that, that's that's what I told, told the Swedish foreign minister on the case of the Nobel Prize. Well, look, let me not say very much more. For those that couldn't see that very well, here, here's some few graphs that come out no better, I suppose. This is, this is the King Carl Gustav giving me the prize, and you had to learn how to do this. And then that evening after the, the banquet, there was a reception with the king and queen, and I, I can't see that very well. So this is my wife, and this is the queen, and this is the king, and I'm sort of way off here to the side. My wife was dominating the conversation. <laughs> the last thing, uh, the, the last day was Friday, the 13th of December, which is Santa Lucia Day. Santa Lucia is actually an Italian saint, but, but she celebrated in Sweden for some reason. I think it's because she must have died on the 13th of December. So this is a, a, a young woman who's playing the part of Santa Lucia, who's giving me a, a, a breakfast with special little little buns and things like that, and coffee and stuff like that. And you can see I'm in bed here. Uh, they, they were supposed to come rather early, but they, they came about 7 in the morning. And I would actually had my camera ready, and I took a whole bunch of pictures, but I forgot to remove the lens cap. So I didn't get anything. My wife was smarter than that. Anyway, look, let me, after you guys know about as much about me now as I do, uh, what I propose to do is a couple of low temperature demos, and then, in fact, I'll answer your questions. So let me just pop this off. So what I have here is this plate. Uh, this copper plate, and it, it weighs a substantial amount. I pull this liquid nitrogen temperature. It's actually a remarkably good conductor. And so we're see what happens to the conductor. Oh, here we go. A magnet. We're going to drop a magnet down. Get a 
it's thin. It's uh, so steamy on this side. I can't tell. There's a little glass window, but I can't really tell how much a little bit more. Uh, 
uh, trips was just remarkably enjoyable. They were all fun, treated, no one treats Nobel laureates badly, I would say, so far. Uh, but at the same time, I'm a professor at Stanford, and I'm supposed to be, I'm actually, I'm an award-winning teacher at Stanford, said. So, so I called him up and I said, look, I'm being asked to give all these, these talks and stuff like that, I'm sure it's good publicity, public relations for Stanford, uh, but I don't know how to do all of that stuff and do my teaching as well. And the answer was, well, we're so proud of the fact that a prize-winning teacher at Stanford is also Nobel laureate. And then there was this pause, pause, and he said, well, I'm sure you'll figure out some way of making it work. <laughs> so I, I, worked, I don't know. I think I spent close to half time on the road last year. Uh, I think I, I visited, I gave talks in 45 different places. Uh, that was the first year. Last year, I think I gave talks at 35 different places, or something like that. So, I mean, still, I don't know. I would guess I probably flew 80, 80 to 90,000 air miles again. I mean, some of the neat places you go. Uh, I spent. Let's see. Is, uh, just for, uh, December, just until just before Christmas in Israel last year. Uh, last September, I went to the Canary Islands to address the American. Uh, the Spanish Physical Society. Uh, this September, I went down to Peru, went to Machu Picchu, saw the Lost Sea of the Incas. Uh, it's just all sorts of really neat things to do. I, you know, I, uh, in February, I'm going to the French Alps and then on to Bergen, Norway, to talk to a group of, of uh, uh, Norwegian physics students. They said they thought I was the obvious choice because A, I made a major discovery, and B, I'd done it as a student, so they could they could uh, you know uh, relate to that more. And then they said, besides, we think you're cool. And I said, how can I say no to anyone that thinks I'm cool? <laughs> so you do a lot of that stuff, but you come back, and all of the work that you were supposed to be doing is just piled up. My desk has not I mean, it was sort of interesting. Last at the end of last summer, I, I had a pile that it, that it just developed the things that I never got to because I was too busy. And uh, I, I went through all that stuff and said, "Well, it's too late for this." Well, I'm glad I didn't have to worry about that. Finally, got down to the bottom. The bottom piece was from October 9, 1996. That was the day that the Nobel Prize was announced. So that was the day that that pile started forming, and it was this high. And that was all sorts of stuff that I was supposed to do that I never really got to. So, it, you know, it depends. If you're one of these people that sort of feels the responsibility for doing things, you can end up being torn. Because on the one hand, I feel that it's a responsibility that Nobel laureates have to, to go out and represent science and represent their institutions and, and basically try to explain, you know, what it is that science is all about and, and why it's worth supporting. Uh, but at the same time, in fact, I've got you know very uh, uh, challenging and rewarding uh, tasks that I have to do at Stanford in terms of my own research program, which still goes on uh, uh, despite my absence with my graduate students and, and my teaching and my mentoring for both graduate students and undergraduate students. And all the committees. I mean, if you're in a university and, and you can't say no, you end up being you know on all sorts of practice. But it is my uh, what exactly is a super? Okay, good question. Uh, first of all, the first things that were called super were superconductors, and they were they were conductors where, in fact, uh, there was no resistance to the flow of electrical currents. Now, uh, a superfluid is typically is neutral, so you, you don't have electrical currents flowing through neutral entities. That is to say, helium atom does not carry charge; it's neutral. It has both positive and negative charge. But the mass can flow without the dissipation of any energy. So in the same sense that electrical currents can flow in a superconductor without dissipation of any energy, you can have mass flowing in a super superfluid without the dissipation of any energy. In fact, you could take a donut-shaped container and if you get the, the, the liquid helium flowing around in a circle, as long as you keep it cold, in fact, it'll continue to flow virtually forever. And one of the neat things is that if you if you start with it just below the transition temperature, which in the case of helium-3 is at melting pressure, 2.49 thousandths of degree above absolute zero, as you cool down from there, in fact, the angular momentum actually increases. It looks like angular momentum is not conserved. It's very strange distance. 
So a superfluid do all sorts of weird things. Helium-3, I think the value of it is, is that in fact it's an extremely <coughs> complex superfluid. It's anisotropic, very much in the sense that liquid crystals are anisotropic. The properties depend upon which direction that that team was beginning to talk about that a little bit. And so we've learned a lot about uh, a type of order which is explained by the BCS theory by studying superfluid three. People think that the uh, large fractions of all neutron stars, by the way, are superfluid. It's unfortunately difficult to do the, you can't do experiments, we can't get close to neutron stars, but if we didn't, we would, have never, we would never come back. So one doesn't do those experiments, but, but still, like, there's strong evidence to suggest that. Any other questions? Yes? Can absolute zero actually ever be reached, or is that a physical possibility? Yes, you can get arbitrarily close to it, but you can't reach it. It's a little bit like, hmm, I shouldn't have said that. I was going to say it's a little bit like the velocity of light, and that you can approach it, but you can't ever get to it. Uh, the reasons you can't in the case of the velocity of light is, is that any object that, that you've accelerated becomes heavier as it approaches the velocity of light. And eventually, it gets so heavy, you simply can't push on it hard enough to get it there. In fact, it's massively the infinite typical velocity of light. In the case of absolute zero, it's really a matter of refrigeration. Uh, the thing which actually makes refrigeration processes go is, is, is the disorder of the system, which is called the entropy. And, and the systems can only have a finite disorder. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, in, in this technique that I used uh, where I did adiabatic solidification of solid helium-3, liquid helium-3, it's the disorder of the nuclear spins in solid helium-3, which is disordered. And, and, and that's R log 2, natural log 2. That's a measure of the disorder in some, some units. But in fact, the cooling capacity of that is that the difference in entropy between two phases, let's say, times the temperature. So as the temperature goes to zero, your cooling capacity goes to zero. And just as as, as you couldn't do that last time to get something at the speed of light, you can't get anything to absolute zero. That doesn't mean, by the way, that, I mean, people will think that at absolute zero, all motion ceases, right? How many people have heard this before? All motion ceases at absolute zero. It's, it's all wrong. It's just not true at all. Uh, for instance, this copper, the coolest carbon copper, all returnally close to absolute zero, the conductional electrons, that is the ones that carry the charge from one side to the other, would be sipping around inside this, com this copper, some of them with velocities approaching 1% of the velocity of light. And that velocity stays there even as you cool this thing to absolute zero. It has nothing to do with the temperature. There are other kinds of motion as well. There's something have you guys all heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Yeah. Okay. So if you take a, let's say, a helium-free atom and you localize it in a lattice, there must be an uncertainty in its momentum. And that, that atom bounces around rather wildly within the, 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 the potential energy well that it's sitting in. And that is another kind of energy that, that simply can't go away as the temperature is lowered out to zero. There are other kinds of, 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 of energy as well that are required. But, but the only kind of energy of, of motion that disappears is, in fact, the random thermal motions. So those are a very particular kind of, 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 of energy, uh, magnetic energy. And in fact, it does disappear, but, but in fact, nothing else. Any other questions? Yes? Um, with superfluid helium-4, I mean, is there a different thing? I mean, uh, you did the helium-3, is there a big difference between the two of them? Well, I suppose that, first of all, helium-4 becomes a superfluid at 2.17 degrees Kelvin, so it's about a factor of 1,000 higher in temperature. A helium, there are two kinds of particles in nature. There, there are particles like electrons, which we call Fermi particles. They have to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Helium-3 atoms are Fermi particles, like electrons. And then there are particles that are called Bose particles. An example of Bose particles are uh, for instance, quanta of light are Bose particles. Okay. Now, Fermi particles, no two Fermi particles can be in the same quantum state, whereas for Bose particles, they love to be in the same quantum state. In fact, helium-4 atoms are Bose particles, and, and the probability that a Bose particle will scatter off of something into a particular direction is proportional to the number of particles without momentum that are going in that direction. So, in fact, it's, it, they're really very different in that sense. If you look at the zero viscosity, they both have zero viscosity. But helium-4 
I think it's, it's much easier to study and so easy to report the 2.17 degrees Kelvin is, is really very high temperature. In fact, I actually used to at Stanford do demonstrations the last day of this class that I'm teaching on light and heat, where I would demonstrate superfluidity and students could actually look in and see it. Helium-3, because it's so cold, you don't get to see it at all. But it has a number of other properties which helium-4 doesn't have. For instance, the helium-3 entities which, which form the superfluid are called Cooper pairs. It consists of, of sort of a weakly bound pair of helium-3 atoms. And they have magnetic moments, and so you can do magnetic resonance experiments. And, and the magnetic resonance properties are unlike anything that any, anyone has ever seen before. In fact, when we submitted our paper uh, showing this behavior, it was rejected by physical review letters because the reviewer didn't think we understood how to do NMR. He thought these results were impossible. So, so how, how did you get the Cooper pair of helium to freeze it like that? The, uh, two? Well, you have to get it very cold. That's the thing. Uh, the, the, to form the pair, there has to be a weak attractive interaction between the atoms uh, at, at, at very low temperatures. And that weak attractive interaction, I could explain to you what it is, but you wouldn't believe it. I mean, you wouldn't understand it. Well, well I'll, I'll try it, okay? In a superconductor, how can you have an attractive interaction between two electrons? After all, they repel each other, right? right. So, so but, but you have to somehow form a Cooper pair which consists of two electrons. The way that happens is you have an electron which is going through the lattice. As it goes through the lattice, the positive ions of the, of the, the contain the nuclei the, the, that, are, that are sitting in the lattice sites are, are attracted to this negative electron as it goes through. And so for a very brief period of time after this electron goes through, there will be this cloud of positive polarization left behind it. That will be attractive to an electron going the other direction. So they are, they are, the bound pair are going in opposite directions, in fact. But that is what forms Cooper pairs. It's this, it's this weak cloud of attractive uh, charge, positive charge. In the case of superfluid helium-3, the helium-3 atoms like to surround themselves with helium-3 atoms whose nuclear spins are pointing in the same direction. These are, this is called ferromagnetic spin fluctuations. So there you have a two-bit word. Uh, but, but if you have a helium-3 atom going through the liquid, it tends to leave behind it, again, this, this cloud of, of up polarization, assuming this was a positive uh, up spin. And that will be attracted to a helium-3 atom with an uh, up spin that's going the opposite direction. So that's, that is the sense of the form. Very deep questions. See me in my office, okay? Very in 150, sometime inside. Any other questions? Maybe less physics oriented. Yes? See what's spin? Pardon? What is spin? Spin is a quantized angle momentum. So it, <laughs> it's an intrinsic property of particles. So for instance, the electron and the proton have spin. Uh, it's, it's, the spin is, is one half unit of, of h bar. h bar is Planck's constant. There's no way of getting rid of it. It, it, it is an intrinsic property of the particle. And, and, and a spin one half particle can point up or point down. Those are the two possibilities. Uh, sir, yes? I'll ask you an easy question. Um, what, like how much money do they get for the Nobel Prize? And what did you do with your prize money? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the prize the year that I got it was, was worth uh, $1.12 million. Now you, you share it with three people, so that gives me, I think, about 370, but I didn't take it back from Sweden in time. And the, the, the dollar uh, was getting stronger with respect to the Swedish crown, so by the time I got it, it was 360,000. And then you pay federal and state taxes. That takes 45%, so I was left with about 192,000. Oh, oh, the other thing I didn't say is when you go to Stockholm, you are <coughs> Uh, it, you are invited to bring a certain number of guests with you. And they say in principle 10, but, but we all brought 13. These people are put up in the Grand Hotel in downtown Stockholm, which is overlooking the Royal Palace. And their room charges are deducted right off the top of your cross. <laughs> so, but the nice thing is it's before taxes. So I don't know, everyone else is so irritated that this thing is taxed, I think that they try to spend as much of it off the top as they could. So I, I ended up spending about twenty thousand bucks before I actually got hold of the money. You don't pay taxes when it's still still the foundation's money. And, and then what was left? Uh, uh, there was one hundred ninety-two thousand dollars, and I after taxes, 
and I took 10% of that and bought a camera of my dreams. I said, how can you spend that much money for a camera? You can spend easily spend that much money for an automobile, which lasts longer. You didn't think of it, didn't that way? No, so I bought a, it's a Swedish camera called the Hasselblad, and if you ever get married, probably the people that are taking the pictures will be using a Hasselblad camera. I, of course, bought the top of the line, and these things have the best Zeiss lenses. So I've taken, and, you know, for me it's been great because I've gone to all these places and I've taken pictures with my Hasselblad camera, and they are all over the walls of my, my office. So, yes, that's what I did with the prize money. The rest of it, of course, I printed away in the stock market. My wife and I have this, this investment strategy we buy high and sell low. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What school was John Bardeen affiliated with? Okay, John Bardeen was at the University of Illinois. So oh. that was why he was in Illinois. How many people, John Bardeen, by the way, is the only human being that's won two Nobel Prizes in the same field. So one of them was for the BCS theory, which he shared, of course, with, with Cooper and Schrieffer. What was his other Nobel Prize? Does anyone know? You don't count. Why you guys? You rely on his inventions all the time. Transistor. That's again. The transistor. That was Bardeen Cooper and Shreve, the Bardeen Brad and Shock. That was done in worked on in Bell Laboratory. He was at Bell Labs before I was. And I suppose because of his success, I was able to do whatever I wanted while I was in You guys look like you have to go pretty quick, is that right? One last question. Yes. Well, shall we say my graduate students are doing work. So we're actually doing an experiment right now. Helium-3, liquid helium-3 is the purest substance known to man. Nothing dissolves in it. And yet it would be extremely nice. Well, at higher temperatures, helium-4 dissolves in helium-3. But its phase separates out with, a, with an activation energy of about 6 tenths of a degree. So by the time you get down to 10 thousandths of a degree, there should be no more than one atom of helium-4 per mole of helium-3. So that's how pure it is. Of course, people can't measure that, but, but we speculate. Anyway, uh, the, but the interesting thing would be to see how this, see how this particular anisotropic BCS state responds to impurities. You can't put impurities in liquid helium three. So now we're looking at helium three uh, in a matrix. Uh, it's called aerogel. Does anyone know what an aerogel is? I should have brought some. It's great stuff. It's, it's, it's a gel that where you remove all of the, the liquid and all that's left behind is this matrix of interconnecting strands that, made, that held the gel together. And in this case, it's a silica gel, and the strands consist of little <coughs> beads of silica, which are about 40 angstroms in diameter, and they're interconnecting. It's to make this stuff so that it's the density of the aerogel is less than the density of the air that's in the spaces in between the silica strands. Anyway, that's, that's one of the things that we're looking at right now. But I continue to do work on superfluid helium-3 and solid helium-3. We're also looking at the most disordered materials in the world. We're looking at, at the properties of glasses of aluminum. So when you have a million and a half bucks worth of low temperature equipment, you do low temperature physics. And that's one problem with being experimental. You end up getting stuck. But it's fun. Any other questions? OK, well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for coming to this house. Thank you very much.